Well, since we know everyone really shows up for the guests as opposed to any of us founders talking, uh, we'll just go ahead and get started with some announcements. That way, when everyone else joins, Dennis will be ready to go. Uh, first of all, thanks, thanks for your time this evening. Uh, the last day of February, which is great for those of you in the Midwest. We're hoping that means the, um, the spring calendar is coming quickly. Uh, February was a long, brutal month in Columbus. So uh, we're, we're happy to be turning the calendar. Um, <clears throat> just a few uh, left field related announcements. Uh, not in any particular order, but we got a few things and I don't want to take away too much of Dennis's time, but um, just run through a few things that have come in here and there and maybe uh, address some questions uh, and also a few comments. First up is the EIF and the status of the EIF fund uh, through Josh McCallan. I'm sure many of you saw the email that came out uh, last week asking for soft commitments so that we get a sense of what we're going to go back to Josh with. Uh, we were fortunate enough towards the end of last year to hit the top tier return on that because we were able to pool uh, all of our commitments together, if you will, uh, and, and use that towards uh, the top tier funding bucket. Well, as of right now, through soft commitment, we are there again. Uh, so Jim is going to be sending out a note uh, some point next week or maybe the week after he's on vacation this week. So it just depends on when he gets caught up. Uh, with a status report there. So all things, for those of you that are interested in that fund or maybe missed it the first time around, uh, we're going to move forward in this, uh, what is it, fund four, I believe it is. So everything is looking good there as far as being able to use our collective investments uh, to get that top tier return. So again, that's through your soft commitments. So as long as we you know, move forward with those soft commitments, we're going to be in good shape. Um. <clears throat> And so sort of related to that, we, we get asked questions often about other LFI investment opportunities like this. You know, we did a couple towards the end of last year that went swimmingly well. It looks like this EIF one is going to go well again. So be on the lookout. We, we do have that as an agenda item for us in the planning process for 2022 is to figure out how we can bring additional opportunities to the community, uh, which would then hopefully be some additional perks uh, to folks in, in various forms. So we're going to look at different asset classes, uh, not just keep it multifamily or, you know, equipment like the last two have been, but we'll, we'll take a look at self-storage, uh, triple net lease, and, you know, whatever else comes our way uh, with the goal of presenting it to you guys because they're good deals. Uh, like any other deal, everybody's just going to have to do their, their own due diligence, but our goal is to bring some, unique and creative things to you guys, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So keep an eye out, uh, more stuff to come there. Uh, those of you that listen to the podcast the last few weeks have probably noticed there's been a couple additional ads on there. One is from Mag Capital, one of the sponsors that we like that does triple net lease buybacks, and then Ashcroft Capital was this past week. So we still have TribeVest on there as, as a big time sponsor of ours, but we added two, two more in there that are gonna rotate through. And that's really uh, a tribute to you guys, our community who is, who is backing these sponsors and supporting these sponsors. They feel comfortable enough to uh, lend their name and voice to, well, I guess it's Jim's voice. I, I guess I'd say uh, their script, their, their name and script to Jim to read off. So a big thank you to you guys for um, supporting a couple sponsors that we know, like, and trust. So there'll, there'll probably be some more of that going forward. So keep, uh, keep an ear out and a, and a tune um, to what goes on there from an ads, ad standpoint. But again, a thanks to you guys for supporting these sponsors of ours. Hey, Chad, are you able to mute folks? Or if you guys are not on mute, there we go. Thank you. Uh, and then just two more quick things. One, the mound visits that you guys know are, are taking place. Uh, Ryan, Chad and myself are hosting on uh, Clubhouse and Steve is hosting them on Wonder. I think we've had, I lost track, I think maybe seven, six, seven, somewhere in there thus far. There's another one tomorrow at 1230 on Clubhouse. Uh, please take advantage of those if, if, you're, if you're able to. We're getting a whole range of participation from people just jumping on and sitting back, listening and, and, and soaking in all the information to those that are, you know, really engaged and active. And I think uh, what we've got so far is the feedback has been tremendous as far as just conversation 
uh, and the topics that are covered. There's really no set agenda yet. We might go down the path where we do have an, an agenda, but right now we're just trying to make it impromptu as far as the topic, as far as the topics go. And we're trying to cover a whole range of times throughout different, different days. You know, Steve's more of a night owl. So he's got the night covered where uh, the other three of us are, are trying to pick uh, different parts during the day. And, and even Chad last, last Saturday doing a weekend spot. So we're going to continue with those uh, until the feedback uh, goes the other way, but it seems like each call we're getting more and more people on there. So we certainly appreciate the feedback. We uh, appreciate the participation and please feel free to just come on and listen if you want, or, or pop on, add your two cents and, and drop back to mute. No, no problem. We just, we welcome uh, the company and the participation. So look forward to having you on those again. And then last but not least, certainly is the intros. You know, we rolled this out uh, the beginning of the year. And again, this is another platform, new, new platform for us in our community, just trying to ramp up the networking and get everybody introduced to each other. If you're able to participate, great. It's pretty painless, pretty easy. Uh, and, and the participation there and the feedback there, is, uh, like the uh, mound visits, has been very good. So hopefully folks are uh, taking part in those. And I think the experience level, uh, even myself having spoken to a couple, what I would say, newbies, one who hasn't done a deal yet, uh, I hung up thinking, oh, my gosh, that, that guy is well on his way. And certainly uh, some, of the, some of the points that he, he had in the conversation were even good for somebody like me. So... <laughs> Please don't be afraid. Don't think that your experience level should hold you back on these. This is really just a networking uh, opportunity. And with that, I will say my last intro was on Thursday with Dennis. So uh, we spent over a little over an hour, uh, and it was it was fantastic. I, I walked away with a lot of um, a lot of knowledge. We had a couple laughs and and just got to know each other. And that's that's what it's all about. So you never know where this conversation is going to going to take you. And I completely forgot that he was going to be our guest uh, guest spot tonight. So it's great to see him a few days later. And we certainly appreciate his time. So take again, take advantage of those those different platforms that we're, we're throwing out there to you guys so you can uh, network and get to know some other like minded individuals. Um, so I'll just do again, I, I said that Dennis and I chatted on the intro last Thursday. He was also kind enough to be pod cast guest number 47 i believe it was which was january 16th so hopefully you had a chance to listen to that interview that jim did with dennis it was it was great uh he also i'll give you a, a plug for your book he also has this book out which is one of my favorites from a structure standpoint it's chock full of great information but really the way that he structured uh his chapters in the interviews that he does in there is is um it's very unique so I would say if you don't have it on your shelf, uh, go out there and, and grab it. Um, so thanks for your time, Dennis. I know Steve's got a little bit more formal uh, intro he's going to do, but I just wanted to say that it, it was a nice way to come out of the intro uh, piece of, of my announcements and, and say that we chatted last week. So Steve, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Sean. So, yeah, so I met. Dennis rather haphazardly. I was at the Accountable Equity Learn and Grow last September. It's a one-day conference that Josh McAllen and his uh, group puts on. It's a nice um, one-day kind of an intimate conference with maybe 30 to 40 um, uh, investors. And this guy walked by and I saw his name tag. I said, Dennis Shapiro. And I thought, why does that name sound so familiar to me? And I, I was, as I was, we were taking a tour and I, I kind of flipped on my phone and, and looked through my Kindle book list. I said, oh my gosh, just, I'm reading this guy's book right now. So, so it's kind of funny that, you know, the author of the, of the book that I'm actually reading at that time uh, just walked by me. So I, I approached him and he was nice enough to uh, not blow me off. And uh, <laughs> uh, we had a nice little conversation. Um, I told him that uh, he wrote the book that uh, if I were to ever write a book on real estate investing he stole my idea so but he did a much much better job than i would have ever done so uh, uh but anyways uh just more uh, formal uh, introduction here dennis invested uh, started investing in real estate in 2012 when the market was just beginning to recover from the uh, financial crisis he built a, a cash flowing portfolio including many uh, alternative assets such as note and atm funds mobile home parks life insurance policies tech startups industrial short-term rentals and more he then co-founded an investment club for accredited investors in 2019. So following the success of his investor club, he launched SIH Capital Group, 
which provides accredited investors with a simplified strategy to invest for passive income. And as, as, as we mentioned, he is the author of the Alternative Investment Almanac, which I think everyone here should read because it's an excellent uh, book that covers a lot of different topics and does a, a very, very thorough job of going through a lot of the asset classes. So uh, with that, uh, we'll turn it over to Dennis. Uh, thank you, guys. That was an excellent intro. I'm humbled, a little speechless. The, the funny story about when Steve came up to me at Renault was he was the first person to ever recognize me anywhere. I literally just published the book in June, and it's still a little offsetting when someone comes up to you and says, hey, did you write a book? And yeah, I did. It was like two months ago and he actually said nice things. And he actually said that exact same phrase, well, you stole my idea. And I, he said, but I think you did it better than I would have done. So I said, thank you so much. And then he said, you have to meet Jim. You have to meet the rest of the left field investors. And he introduced me to Jim, I think that week. And then I've been talking to Jim and then I've been participating on the intros. And every time I, ha I get off a call, I'm always amazed, even if it's a newbie, it's they're in a better place than where I was when I started. I literally, the only people I had to learn from was my own investment mistakes. And I've done a share of them. And I share that in my book and to have a community where you could bounce ideas off each other and genuinely have the best of the best operators deals filtered out to you guys that got, that puts you guys in such a great, great starting point. Uh, so that was just a little bit. Uh, I just wanted to mention that and I'll get started. I know my partner, on affordable house, housing is also on the call, John Suarez. He's our property manager, but he's so much more than that. He's literally a wealth of knowledge when it comes to affordable housing. So without with being, but we're gonna have a chance to introduce him during the presentation. So I'm gonna screen share, get, get into the presentation. Um, I don't know how you guys do with Q and A's or anything like that, but I don't mind if you guys have a question, shoot it out, or if you guys are gonna save them to the end, uh, completely flexible with either one. So I'm gonna screen share. All right, can everybody see my screen? Yep, it's up, Dennis. Okay, perfect. Uh, so the presentation that we're gonna be doing today is affordable housing. And we're gonna talk about how it's actually a different type of multifamily investment from your usual value add that you find today. Uh, this is just the usual disclaimer. This isn't actually an offering for any typical investment, but I got tired of kind of taking them out for offerings and then putting them back in. Uh, so I'll just tailor it a little bit where we're not soliciting and we're not saying that affordable housing is right for everybody. Affordable housing has its own risks and you should always consult with your legal, your tax, your financial pro professional. So the goal here is just to give education on the actual niche of affordable housing. So the purpose of this presentation from the start of the presentation to the end of the presentation, what I want to get out of it, what, what I want you guys to get out of it is to get getting rid of some of the myths about investing in the affordable housing space because there's tons of them actually out there. So the way we're gonna do that, the way we're gonna de demystify affordable housing is we're gonna first, me and John are gonna go over how it's actually very similar to multifamily. Then we're gonna go over the actual differences that the category actually has. And then we're gonna just go over some additional information, but the path between the similarities and differences should, should kind of bridge that gap and it'll, it'll, make, it, it'll be, make it very clear if affordable housing is something that you guys uh, should spend more time researching. Uh, so how is it like, just like any other multifamily investments? And by the way, these pictures in the presentation, this is actually from our last offering. So this is a affordable housing complex. Uh, so it's just one thing to keep in mind when you guys are looking at it. Uh, th these pictures are actual real pictures. Uh, so some of the same benefits. So if anybody's ever invested in a syndication, you know that it, it, even if it's structured as just an LP, you still get a share of the cash flow as long as obviously the, the building, the apartment complex is profitable. Uh, so the first, you know, uh, first benefit of multifamily is cash flow. There's no difference between that and affordable housing. Uh, the second one is an inflation hedge. So as long as fixed debt is used to purchase the real estate, then you, you have that built-in natural inflation hedge where if you're getting a mortgage product of under 4%, inflation stays at 5 6%. That difference, that you can arbitrage that difference and it'll actually make that hard asset cheaper year over year. Uh, so it works exactly the same way as in multifamily as in affordable housing. Uh, next, 
lower volatility, especially if it's a syndication. That means it's private security. You get that same exact thing where you can't just sell it at a moment's notice. And since you can't sell it at a moment's notice, it's a much more consistent investment where you're not waking up like you did today and so that the market was down 450 points. And, you know, uh, that's the, the benefits of private, secure, private securities. And it works exactly the same way as affordable housing. Uh, tax advantages. So, again, it's the same thing. There's PPMs involved. There's a syndication. Uh, if it's 70-30 split, 75-25, 60-40, the, the depreciation will be passed through just like any other syndication. Uh, leverage, there's, there's nothing special here. Affordable housing, same exact thing between 20-30% down payment. And the rest is, you know, your LTV ratio, exactly the same thing as a syndication. So if you've done a multifamily investment, affordable housing is not going to be that much different from the previous ones that you have done. Uh, and then it's passive. Once you wire the money, you know that majority of the work for syndication is done uh, be, the, during the due diligence process because after you wire the money, there's very little, little there's very little a limited partner can actually do after that point. Uh, so, which is a plus if you really enjoy your job and don't want to do anything else. It is equally as passive as in a, a, an affordable housing investment is equally as passive as any multifamily investment. Um, I had to put another slide about inflation rate just because it really is the buzzword uh, between that and geopolitical risks right now. When I was actually making this presentation for a previous deal, uh, the, the, the inflation was only about five and a half percent. Now it's over 7%. And then some, some people actually say it's double digits, but they changed the way that they measure inflation. So what is the best way to fight inflation? And that's uh, obtaining long-term debt that's actually backed by hard assets. Uh, so just like any multifamily, the affordable housing community is at the end of the day, it's a piece of land, there's an apartment building on it, and that is what you're buying a piece of. Uh, so most affordable housing, is completely in demand right now. So the occupancy levels are usually pretty high, which means that you usually will get agency debt from day one. And agency debt is probably the best type of debt you can get in a rising inflation uh, period. Uh, so just like any multifamily team, the, the deals is gonna be largely dependent on the operating team and then the property management that's in place. So this is very similar to any multifamily deal. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, Dennis, I think we lost you. Oh, you can't hear me. There, you're back uh, now. There, we got you back now, I think. Okay. We just missed the quote. Um, that was uh, all I think let me, we missed, so yeah. Okay. So a great operator can save the worst deal, a bad operator can ruin the best deal, right? So just like any multifamily, it's, it's almost 50% the deal and 50% the operator when you're looking at some of these deals. So this is the team we have in place for affordable housing. And obviously this is not gonna be the team that you might be looking at when you're looking at your affordable housing deal, but there are certain attributes that you should be looking for when you're looking at these deals. So uh, my, pro my partner, Anthony, He's, he's a project manager. His project manager with a large healthcare, 15 years, extremely uh, attention. He's ex extremely detailed to attention, uh, extremely attention detailed. Um, and his primary focus is affordable housing. He has other projects, but the, his biggest projects are affordable housing. And then going forward, me and him are only going to be doing the affordable housing. Uh, John, I'll let you introduce yourself uh, because I'll probably do a worse job than you can. And then I'll, I'll jump back in for mine. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Suarez, and I am a uh, property manager at the current uh, employer of multifamily management services of Philadelphia. And uh, I have been so for the last 13 years, but I actually been in the uh, real estate industry since 1986. I have uh, won property manager of the year twice uh, in, out of 2,000 uh, property managers in our portfolio. I've also had uh, property of the year out of, uh, we have probably like almost 40,000 units in our portfolio. And uh, currently I've managed like 450 uh, affordable housing units. And I, I also uh, managed Oxford Hotel, 
which is uh, about a half a mile from the property that we are about to acquire now. So um, good to see you all and uh, hope, hopefully we make some partnership. Uh, again, me, I, I'm not going to go over this because this is kind of redundant from what Steve and Sean mentioned. Uh, so if you guys want to know more about me, feel free to reach out. Uh, so the right property management team. So the property management team that we, we have for our, our deal is a group called MMS Group. John is a property manager with them. The key here is that they have over 38,000 units. And more importantly is that they have a special division to handle affordable housing. Affordable housing, when we go over the differences of affordable housing, you'll understand how attention-oriented how attention oriented it is and how important uh, compliance issues are. So you can't have a class A property manager that's used to uh, managing infinity pools and gazebos managing affordable housing because it's a very situation. as the fact that they actually have a special division inside, which only handles affordable housing. So we have a wealth of knowledge to, if, if John doesn't know the answer to a specific voucher or some, a specific program, we have someone else in, that, in MMS that can easily give us that answer because they deal with this stuff. Uh, so what is our experience with MMS? Uh, like John mentioned, he worked for Oxford Hotel Apartments. That's actually this uh, this building right here. This building was actually built in the 18th century. So it's actually very historical. Um, they worked together for about three years. So we have a working relationship of three years. So one of the things I always mention when I go on podcast as a limited partner, one thing I've always, I always uh, stay true on is I never invest with a property manager and a, an operator that this is their first deal together. I never want to be the, that learning curve because that was my first deal and it was the worst deal I ever did because six months later, you fired the property manager and now, now your whole business plan is completely um, derailed. So in, in this situation, MMS Group has been working with uh, my partner's group, KWW Holdings, for the last three years. Um, we also have two properties in this town and we're actually going to go over some details about this town because it's actually important with the affordable housing element of it. And John is going to be overseeing this next project as well. So that actually helps us to keep, uh, to keep it all in-house. Uh, so now the most important part is the actual differences. And in a lot of ways, I actually think the differences is what actually is the advantages of investing in affordable housing. So before we get into the actual differences, I just want to go over a couple of key terms because these are the terms that kind of keep coming over. And if you ever see any investment in affordable housing, you're always gonna see these three terms. Uh, so the first one is low income housing tax credits. That's, a that's basically a subsidy that the government provides developers to actually build these affordable housing communities. This subsidy usually creates an income restriction on the property and these periods last for two consecutive 15 year periods. Now this is really important, the consecutive 15 year period because there's a lot of opportunity in buying it on the back end of the second 15 year period. And we'll kind of show you what that actually means from a dollar perspective of if, if you actually can invest in a deal like that. The next thing is the AMI. And that is an income, is, that's an that's a income figure that's determined by the US Department, US Department of Housing and Urban Development and the threshold of 40, 50, 60% of whatever the median income is. Uh, so that's really important because if you're building a property in a high cost living adjustment, it might be hard for you to fill it in with tenants that fit that 40, 50, 60 threshold. Um, and then vouchers. So a, vouchers is about, a voucher provides a basically a low income household with rental assistance. The two most common vouchers are tenant-based vouchers and project-based vouchers. So these are common terms and we're gonna go over a couple of them uh, during the presentation. So these are the differences. And again, I would stress out that these are actually the advantages of investing in affordable housing versus any other value add multifamily deal there is. So the first one is there's actually a barrier of entry. You will never ever hear, hey, you know, how many investors are on this call, but how many investors have ever gotten a PPM or an offer for an affordable housing deal? It's much, much rarer. I probably in the course of three to four years as an investor, I've only seen maybe one or two and it's an operator that is in value add and they're just interested in maybe getting into the space, but they don't specialize in actual, uh, in, in this actual space. So the first thing is 
there's a lot of there's a lot of compliance issues and when the sale is complete the sale actually has to be certified by the state so in our example the pennsylvania housing and financial agency or authority has to actually approve us so that means they take a look at me anthony and john and say okay they have the necessary experience to actually manage this property and if they feel that we don't they could actually they have the power to actually complete they don't give their sign off the deal is dead so that means we were went through inspection we got mortgage commitments everything as long as we don't get that sign off by the state the whole deal falls apart so what ends up happening is the seller is aware of it so the seller is decentivized from going to a regular broker putting it on getting a bidding war getting the 30 best and finals because they don't care about the best and finals as someone who they know will actually be able to get approved by the state and be actually able to sell the, the, the property. So that's the first thing is the barrier of entry. And the last deal that we're, we uh, purchased, we did not negotiate against anybody else. It was direct communication between us and the seller. Uh, there was no brokers involved and it was a really, really smooth process. Uh, so the second big advantage is that the business plans, especially in our experience, tend to be expense focused versus income focused. So every time you guys see an offer memorandum these days from a value add deal, the business plans are very cookie cutter. And not to say anything is wrong with them because if they're working, they work. But for the most part, what you end up seeing is a property that comes in, maybe it's 100 units, maybe 12 of those units have already been fixed up and they're already getting the extra $200 a month. And then they're selling the property under the potential of what would happen if the other 88 units are renovated uh, the exact same way. You know, the luxury vinyl floorings and maybe a new kitchen, a new bathroom, and then hopefully command the $200 a month. So the focus on that business plan is all about the income. It's, it, if you renovate it nicely, they will come kind of mentality. In our situation, we are taking over a property that's 100% occupied. And if it's not 100, it's 98 and it fluctuates between 98 to 100. So the focus is not maximizing the income because remember we are restricted on how much we can charge. The focus here is maximize is optimizing the expenses for the property. And we're gonna show you guys some of the strategies that we use for it. And in my opinion, it's a lot safer to, uh, to have a business plan that's focused on stuff that you can control on day one than not knowing if your renovations are gonna be accepted by the market. So that's number two. Number three, is the vouchers and subsidies is, this is actually probably not an advantage, this is just a characteristic of low-income housing, of low-income tax housing uh, properties, is that uh, there are multiple types of vouchers on one properties. To me, that's a good thing because it adds complexity, and when you add complexity, you get less buyers. Um, it's higher occupancy. Did we lose him again? Yeah, Dennis, I think we lost you again, unfortunately. Can you hear me, guys? There, you're back. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you back. Yep. yep. All right. Sorry about that. I, I guess maybe because it's a big Zoom call. I usually never have a problem. Uh, so what was the last part I was up to is the higher occupancy? Yeah, you just finished vouchers. Vouchers. So then... Uh, the next advantage is higher occupancies. So when you get into value add deals, sometimes you'll get that 91, 92, 93% um, occupancy on most deals. The reason why they want to get over that 90 so they can qualify for the agency debt, but that also means the previous uh, seller knows that and they're, they're, there's a condition in value add properties where they tack in the tenants at their last possible minute. So it would be easier transaction. With affordable housing, the demand is so strong, you're usually in the high 90s. Uh, from the get-go. Uh, John, what was Oxford Hotel Apartments? Was it 98 or 100 right now? Right now it's 100. It's been so for the last almost two years. Yeah. So that's and the type have, of tenant turnover. Okay. Sorry, John. Go ahead. And, and uh, we, we also have a waiting list about almost maybe 220 applicants. So that's that's kind of the, the highlight here is that you have a property like that. The next property we're buying is already at 98% occupied. We could use the waiting list for the property, um, the Oxford Hotel Apartments for this property. 
and we could leverage both of them together. So again, you're going to find higher occupancy because there's just a higher demand for these affordable housing uh, communities. Uh, next is something that I learned when I was going through this deal is better financing. So apparently Freddie and Fannie, the agency debt providers, they have a mandate by the government to actually encourage affordable housing development and, and purchases and, and increasing the affordable housing units. So that actually allows us to get certain mortgage project, pro products that are not available to regular value had regular multifamily operators. So for example, we literally got a Freddie Mac affordable housing loan, which came with a, a, with a half percent interest rate reduction. And we also got expedited on the, on the line of closing for the mortgage. Because as you can imagine right now, with a raising, raising interest rate, almost all these operators are scrambling right now to get in and get into the Freddie and Fannie queues. And because of your affordable housing, that gives you that little bit of edge. Uh, lastly, the last advantage is it's a change in buyer pool. So if what happens is once that 30 years, that second 15 year period uh, lapses, what ends up happening is all those restrictions with the barrier of entry that was causing an artificially low amount of buyers goes away. And now the deal becomes a regular market deal. And now all the buyers out of the weed works can come out and actually bid up this property. So you can get a nice premium for your property. So not all vouchers are the same. So this is just a highlight. This is more of a snapshot of our previous deal and what it looked like. So, and we had, Tenant-based vouchers, project-based vouchers, tax credit unions, and home units. So tenant-based vouchers, as, as the name implies, are vouchers that actually stay with the tenant. So if they leave your complex, that voucher goes with them. The problem is whenever you have tenants that they feel like they almost have an asset in this voucher, there's a sense of entitlement. And sometimes you might not get them to participate and follow all the rules of the lease, because they feel like they have something over the landlord and the property manager. The next, the next voucher is a project-based voucher. These things are like gold because they actually stay with the complex. That means if you get someone and all of a sudden their, you know, their son is doing something illegal on the property, you give them that warm warning. And if they don't listen to it, now you can start eviction. And if they lose that apartment, they lose that voucher because that voucher actually stays with the apartment and doesn't go with them. So you have a lot of leverage over the tenant. And it's not like you, the, we're here to, to advocate that the landlord should take advantage of the tenants. But generally speaking, if you have that leverage over the tenant, you'll get a much better quality tenant and a, and a community of better tenants tends to have just create a better community. Um, next is tax credit unit uh, units. So tax credit units are interesting. They're basically someone who is under that uh, adjusted uh, medium income, the AMI, and they're in that 50 to 60 bracket, but they don't qualify for a voucher. They, they're not on any kind of voucher. So they could still take an apartment, it's just their apartment will be slightly reduced. So instead of, for example, charging $1,400 in rent, we can only charge 1,200 because that $200 would go for like a utility allowance for that. Uh, so it's a little bit more affordable. So from, a, from an operator's perspective, one simple business model is to try to get more units on the tenant-based vouchers and the project-based vouchers, especially the project-based vouchers, because it allows us to charge that higher rent. Uh, also on the last project we have, we have what's called home units. This is actually something that is not as common. Uh, so what John was explaining to me about that program is that program by the government that allows tenants to save up all their rent money and they're supposed to be saving up for a down payment so they can buy a home. And the purpose is to get them off the voucher program. So we have about 12 of those units. We're gonna be buying this property. I believe our expiration for that program is gonna be June of 2022. So three months after we purchase it, we're gonna actually evaluate if it's worth the extra compliance. Because every time you throw in another voucher, you're, you're throwing in an extra layer of compliance. Uh, so those are the different types of vouchers. So you could kind of see how reading a T12 or a rent roll with this can get extremely confusing. Because the other thing to keep in mind is a lot of their, the amount that they pay for the rent is based on their income. So it's usually 30% of their income. So you're gonna get vouchers and all these vouchers are gonna have different amounts and it can get very confusing and you need an expert like John to actually go through it 
sit down, make sure all the vouchers are correct. Um, for example, in our, our, on this property, we got in like, we got in three third month and all of a sudden we got a letter from the seller saying that the home unit vouchers were overcharging the people and it completely changed all the numbers and changed everything up. So these are the kind of complexities that you are dealing with affordable housing, but as long as you have the affordable housing experience from your property manager, then they should be able to navigate all these, these challenges. So the other things I want to highlight here is project fees vouchers can allow up to 110% of the fair market rent. So you could actually pay more than regular vouchers. For, uh, I mean, you can actually get more money. And most importantly, it gives some control to the, land, to the landlord and the property manager. John, did you want to mention anything about the vouchers before I go on to the next slide? No, you did a real good job, Dennis. You're almost as good as me. Thanks, John. You're welcome. All right. So this is the second advantage of the focus on a business plan. This is actual real numbers from our last deal. And we're going to show you how we went from operating expenses of 76% to our end goal of around 50%. Keep in mind, this is a property that's built in 1998. So there should be no way that the operating expenses are in the high 70s percent. Uh, so we're going to go over, you know, why it's so inflated, and we'll show you some of the reasons why. Uh, some of it's not exactly what it appears. So one thing I'll highlight on this screen is if you look at the property management fee, you're paying 9.76 percent. Uh, just quick rule of thumb: whenever you're dealing with a large apartment building, the property management fee should be around four, four and a half, maybe five at most, never 9.76. What happens is when we were doing the due diligence, the property management company is a subsidiary of the, of the seller. So they are taking it from one LLC and paying the other LLC. So any CPA on the call knows what that actually ends up doing. Uh, but this is something day one, we can come in. We already got it negotiated down to four and a half percent. And all of a sudden that just saves 30,000. And then well, our total goal for the year is to save about 140,000. So I'll show you some additional levers that we would, we're going to be pulling on a property like this. And the, the thing is, it's not unique just to this one property because we did the exact same thing on a previous property. So it seems like it's a very uh, consistent thing with developers because the business model for developers, if anybody is familiar with the live tech space, is they get a lot of tax credits to build. Their, their business model is not about the operating. Their business model is to develop, build, and use as many credits to build as many properties as possible. So what ends up happening is you, you get an overinflated uh, expense sheet. So I'll show you guys some other levers that we were, were pulling on this type of project. So in this situation, they're still paying an advertising fee. John mentioned that the, uh, the waiting list on the previous property is over 200 people. When we went to look at this situation, their waiting list wasn't even properly set up. So instead of properly setting it up with the housing authority, they, they went and they just set up an account on apartments.com and were spending five to $10,000. So they have access to a waiting list for free of high quality leads, but instead they're, they're paying money. Uh, next thing is insurance. They're a very big operator. So they're not, they're not going around and they're not shopping this policy to as many uh, insurance carriers as we are. Uh, next is the management fee. This is something we negotiated. This is day one savings we're gonna be doing. Uh, and this is honestly what was the easiest one because it was easily overinflated by two times. Uh, the next big one is the payroll. So if anybody's read Brian Burke's book or even seen any, any benchmarks on what payroll should be compared to how many units you have, uh, it should never, you should never have two full-time employees for a property that's only 50 units. So this is gonna allow us to come in and uh, cut down one of those full-time full -time members almost right away. Uh, next is the repairs and maintenance. Um, John, can you shed some light on how we're gonna cut down the repairs and maintenance? Because I know you know this like the back of your hand. Yeah, so, so at this current time, uh, one of the properties that I'm managing now that has 152 units, I actually have what's called a contractor. Um, so we uh, contract the work to, to him directly. So if something happens, then it's a lot cheaper because I don't have to pay uh, the uh, health plans, the, uh, you know, all that good stuff that comes with payroll. So basically is having a good contractor, which we do now. 
and um, he'll sub the work, but he's still responsible for the, uh, you know, end result. So that's, instead of having a maintenance on 24 seven, he's still on call. And there's also a, uh, another uh, staff member of his that is also on call just in case. But uh, yeah, so that's how we'll cut down on expenses, especially on the uh, benefit side. Okay, and then the last expense is the water and sewer. So a lot of times the prop the, this property is built in 1998, is in great overall shape, but the the developer doesn't want to go in there towards the end of the of the the 15 year second period and go in and start putting tons of money in. One item, the electric more or less is in great condition. The plumbing is in great condition because these things haven't really been upgraded in the last 20 years. But what has been upgraded is water efficiency. So the toilets that were placed in 1998, you can imagine, are really old. They are definitely not the 0.8 gallon per flush toilets. So you don't have the aerators, you don't have the showers. So all of that thing combined can come in there right away, put it in. I think we were getting estimates of somewhere between $25,000 a year worth of savings by upgrading the toilets, the shower heads, and the aerators and the sink aerators. So all of those things combined. So that's, that's basically the focus is different because I'm not talking about how the luxury vinyl flooring is gonna command a higher rent. What I'm talking about is things that day one we're gonna be going in and implementing. Uh, so this is the off-market deal. This is the whole point of the fact that the seller needs to feel comfortable with the buyer so they can't just go to a broker. In this situation, the seller did get a, just a broker's value of opinion of where this kind of deal would, would end up landing. And previous deal we had, they actually put it between 5.8 and 6.4. Uh, we were able to leverage our relationship. The fact that he knew that my partner was already certified by the state and was already approved by the state. And we ended up getting this property for uh, 5.8. And then during the, during the diligence, we got down to 5.725. And a lot of that was because the seller felt 100% confident that we will be able to close with no problem. Uh, so again, straight, uh, straight off market deal, the, the broker was trying to sell it for six. We leveraged our relationship. At the end of the day, we got 5.725. It recently appraised about two weeks ago for 6.4 million. So there's considerable amount of equity because it wasn't broker and wasn't a bidding war for this property. Uh, so this is one of the advantages I mentioned, change in buyer pool size. So even though it got appraised for 6.46 million, the appraiser on the deal actually did um, did create a separate valuation based on what would happen when the AMI income restriction was set to expire in six years. So in this case, the property was built in 1998. It's a 30-year restriction until 2028. During the, this income restriction, it has very few buyers because of all the things we mentioned with the vouchers, the AMIs, and, and dealing with all the different nuances. So but what happens in 2028 when the, the program expires? the appraisal, appraiser felt that the, the, the property would be worth 8.38 million. And that's based on today's valuation. So it's probably gonna be over the $10 million range by the time we hold it in 2028. We just wanna make sure our business plan actually matches that. And in this case, we're actually gonna be holding it for 10 years, not for, not for five years, but you wanna make sure that the business plan matches up where when the income restriction actually falls off or expires. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts about affordable housing. So this is this is the segment, I call it taking advantage of a smaller market. So this is Oxford. It's about 30 minutes south of Lancaster, PA. And then it's about 60 miles from Philadelphia. So the cool part here is that the MSA here is actually Philadelphia. And what, what that actually does is that the rents are actually controlled by the locality rate of the MSA and not from the small town that we're actually buying it in. So we're getting to pay a small, we're, we're, we're getting to pay basically a secondary type of pricing for this product, but we're getting the rent that we would get from if this product was located in Philadelphia. So that was, that's a really cool, interesting like arbitrage that you can pull off. Uh, and the second part about it is you wanna make sure you can fill the, the, these communities and with the lower cost of living, because this is a much smaller town, much more blue collar uh, livelihood, it's much easier to get those 40, 50, and 60% AMI tenants in there because you're not gonna have someone coming in and making 100 grand and trying to get one of these apartments. 
the other thing, I just want to go back for one second here. Um, this is a small town population, and this was we got a lot of feedback from our investors that they were really uncomfortable about this. But the interesting part here is that the trend is going up from 43 to 100 to 5600. I've seen so many deals where the trend was going down, and we avoid those deals. And here, we actually felt 100% confident in this deal because if you've ever been in Oxford, Oxford is landlocked, so it's surrounded by Amish farmland. So the town itself is very stable, has a great uh, population that you know commutes to Philadelphia, commutes to Lancaster, but it, it's it's landlocked. It has a strong a, a strong sense of community. Um, the potato chip company Hers, if you guys ever heard of it, uh, Hers actually has sits on the board of like the Oxford Economic Plan, uh, Oxford uh, like Economic Board. Uh, so it has a it's a very interesting small town. Uh, so then light tech deals in the right market can operate very similar or even better than a market rate deal. In this situation, we're actually getting better than what it would be because if we were net closer to Philadelphia, we'd have to be paying a much lower cap rate and we'd have to be paying a much higher price per door to get the exact same rent that we couldn't go above anyway. So this is where it's pretty cool if you get the right deal in the right location. Uh, so additional information. So one of the things about me wanting to make this presentation is because when people think affordable, now my first property in 2012 was affordable housing, was a Section 8 property in a low-income area. It resembled more like this. And in reality, the properties that we invest in is this. It's a duplex. I was showing you guys pictures of the outside of, uh, throughout, the, throughout the deal. But you could see that these units are duplexes. There's master bedrooms with bathrooms on site. There's a washer and dryers. There are, there's a dishwasher in the, the laundry. There's parking, there's two parking spots for every single tenant. It is a higher end product. And one thing John mentioned recently, we were talking about this before we were looking at the presentation is because everybody confuses affordable housing with housing authority housing. Housing authority is what people associate this is, this is this. And when you get stuff like this, you automatically think it's high crime, you know, uh, you know, drug dealing going on. And when you're dealing with a beautiful duplex that encourages families to be here, that hardly ever leave and you get a great community, there's kids playground around and you get a completely different product. So that's what I wanted to make sure. I want to, next time you guys hear affordable housing, do not think this, think more this. And then I'll actually give you guys two real life case studies. So this was Oxford Hotel Apartments. This was uh, when they first bought it, it wasn't painted as it was in pictures. Uh, it was a 22 unit they bought in 2018. Uh, my partner paid 1.1 million for it. At the time of purchase, it was only occupied, by, it was only 78% occupied. And here's the key, 80% operating expenses. Again, same seller. Um, my partner brought, bought it, brought John in, John took over, cut down the expenses. Within a year, he got it down to 50%. Now, that's pretty impressive given that this, this apartment, this Oxford Hotel Apartments was actually built in like the 18th century. So to get that type of, you know, a, a cost efficiencies, it really is a marvel in how good John does what he does. Um, recently, the property got valued over $2 million. Anything was able to return half their money last year and then the other half is going on and they average like double digit returns. So this turned into a home run. And this leads us to our next deal. This was the Oxford Village residence. Uh, same exact thing, uh, low income housing, same seller. Um, again, 76% operating expenses. Very similar. Here is the levers that we pulled there. Uh, so it's a very cookie cutter business model. And we're taking along John and the MMS group, and we're anticipating uh, to bring it down to around the 50% range by the end of the first year. And that's it. And this is actually a picture. So again, one thing about Oxford is it's a super cool town. So in the back of these beautiful condo developments, you actually have this horse farm because all the land is landlocked over there. So the tenants can actually like, the, ten the residents can actually walk out and literally pet these, these horses. And this is an actual picture from the back of the property. Uh, so I, it's one of my, I, I call it a free amenity for, for our residents. Uh, but thank you guys for being patient. I hope I didn't go over the limit. 
Uh, if you guys want to reach me more at sihcapitalgroup.com, uh, my phone number's here, but I, you know, I'm trying to get more involved in the left field community. And if you guys come in person to the Learn and Grow event that Josh McAllen hosts, uh, I know Sean was talking about it briefly about the income fund. Josh does these events on a quarterly basis. I'll be the speaker at the next event. It's not going to be on affordable housing. It's going to be on a different topic. But if you guys come out, I would love to guys meet you guys. Whoever comes out, I would love to meet you guys in person. Uh, so I'll open it up. I'll stop sharing. And then I'll open it up to any questions you guys might have. So Dennis, quick question for you. There were several of us that were out in LA at the end of January for the IIREC conference. And the big thing in California, as you can imagine, is affordable housing. Is when, when they say affordable housing there, it's a very different type of affordable housing than what you're referencing, correct? It is state specific. So we have to be compliant with the Oxford House, the Housing Authority and and so they are going to be nuances, but if you look at the nitty gritty, you're going to have vouchers daily. You're going to be, most of those buildings are going to be light tech buildings. So they'll be in that income restriction period. So there's going to be overlap, but it might not be the exact same product from here to here. But most of the time, like for us, we're probably only going to be dealing in the state of Pennsylvania. And so we'll probably have that specialty in that one state, but that's just something you would want to look at if, if it's an operator in a different state. Makes sense. Thanks. So, Dennis, if we're interested in investing, um, do you usually do a performa for five years in terms of returns? Or, and, and what do you think your hold time is going to be on these assets? So, we originally did the performa for Oxford Village residences for the typical five to seven. And then November came, and then inflation came. And then we had a choice, do we stick with the five to seven or do we go to seven to 10? And we sacrificed probably a couple of basis points of IRR to go to 10, just because we're locking in fixed debt on the 4%. So in this case, we, we locked it in, we, we went for the 10 year, we sacrificed a little bit of returns, but I feel like it just puts us in a better position. And you know, in terms of the other similarities between this and a multifamily deal, this is very similar to the returns you would get in most multifamily deals. So you're looking at, I think our cash on cash, I forgot what I, the exact number was because we have a refi scheduled in like year four. So even though it's gonna be a 10 year hold, we expect them to do a pretty significant refi in year four, but IRR between 13 to 15%, right in that ballpark. Uh, I think cash on cash is somewhere in the 8% range on this type of deal. So very similar to what you would get in the, you know, just regular multifamily space. Hey, Dennis, you mentioned some of the intangible qualities that you look at, like the Amish farmlands and having a strong community. I'm curious about some of the other intangible qualities you look for that pertain specifically to affordable housing. That's a good question. John, what do you think? Uh, that's that's interesting because you've been to more of these affordable housing properties than I am. What, what's, what, what do you say to that? I'm trying to unmute it. Say the question one more time. What anemones are we looking for? Is that what you're saying? Actually, the intangible qualities. So he mentioned like an Am Amish farmland or a strong sense of community or someone on the economic development board. Um, are there other things like that that are specific to affordable housing that you've honed into over the years? So one of the other things that we look at also is that is good for affordable housing is uh, if the uh, city or the borough township has a plan, a growth plan, and, and Oxford uh, Village is actually growing very quick. O Oxford uh, Borough is growing very quick. And um, they're starting to bring in the arts and it's just growing. So the growth is, is one of the other things that, that we look for. Thank you. You're welcome. 
had actually spoke in the intros a few weeks ago, so good to see you again. Um, I, I just had a question, just curious uh, in terms of this, uh, this low income housing market, I wonder, is there any overlap with the opportunity zones and uh, sort of that, that tax benefit that you get in investing in those kind of, you know, pressed areas? Uh, I was just curious if there's any overlap or if that factors into sort of the, um, the ultimate benefits uh, that the investors might be getting. So I know our last deal is definitely not an opportunity zone. I personally, as an investor, I'm not a fan of opportunity zones. Uh, and that's just pretty subjective because I don't like placing my money in a place that hasn't done well over the last course of years, just because of a tax reason. So that's my personal. So I would never invest because the reason is that it's an opportunity zone. If it, if it is an opportunity zone, I look at it as just like a bonus. Uh, but John, in your experience, are a lot of these light tech deals, are they in opportunity zones? Because I think that's kind of the second part of that question, right? Yeah, it, it all varies, but um, I did have an opportunity zone here in Lancaster um, where there is one that, that we're doing as well that I'm also involved with. Um, so yeah, there's, there's there, they, they, affordable housing is being done with you know, some ozone areas. But it'll be deal dependent and it's not necessarily they go hand in hand. Correct. Well, it depends on the deal. Thanks. Sure. Got it. Hey, Dennis. Very, very good presentation. Really appreciate it. Uh, a question for you on, uh, on the rents. Uh, one, two questions, I suppose. One is how often are the rent restrictions reevaluated, particularly? these days that rents are increasing uh, quickly. And then also, is there any opportunity for lobbying or negotiating the restrictions after the fact? So I, I think, John, so, so the first part of that question is, I guess, how often we could raise the rent on some of these. Is that right, Rob? They're, yeah. They're done, they're done on a yearly basis. So, um, Every year that our contract comes up with the housing authority, um, we're allowed to request it two months prior, 60 days prior, and then we can uh, request the uh, increase. Now, um, there's some compliance differences. For example, if somebody moves in in November and the rent increases can occur in April, that unit will not get a rent increase until the, the cycle's one full year. Mm. So after that, then, then Two months um, prior to our contract, we can request the rent increases. Got it. And is there any opportunity to uh, to lobby for additional increases, or is it all formulaic that at a certain time period it will increase a certain amount? Period. So that's a good question. Be in, in 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 reference to the property that they're we're about to acquire with a. Uh, Oxford Village, because it has so many programs, they all have restrictions, different restrictions. So they're kind of restricted. Uh, Anthony, I know, has tried to lobby to give more, but they usually max us out. Yeah. We get maxed out. Okay, thanks. Sure. Any more questions, guys? If not, um, now we're gonna do a little bit of networking on wonder.me. I put the link in the uh, chat. So um, uh, if you go over to the link, you can press that link and then the password is LFI22. And you do, uh, unfortunately you do have to be on a, a laptop or a computer to do this because uh, it's um, a little bit compl compl complex, but there are different zones that you can go to if you want to discuss apartments. You can go to this one zone that says multifamily. If you want to discuss self-storage, there might be a group of people that, that can go over there. Um, so just you can just kind of move your, your, your face essentially with your cursor. And uh, once you get close enough to a person, you'll actually see their video pop up. So um, and Dennis and John, you're more than welcome to uh, join us on that uh, if you like. Um, does anybody else have anything else uh, to add? Post to that again. It's on the chat. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, and make Steve, sure you just, shut. Oh. Make sure you shut off your Zoom, by the way, too, because otherwise there's some echo that goes on. Steve, and I'll, I'll also mention, um, I'm a firm believer of asking the operator on a lot of these newer assets that you're not familiar with, just to follow along on the deal. So if anybody ever wants to reach out and follow along on how an affordable housing deal performs versus a regular deal, just feel free to shoot me an email and I'll throw you on the investor list as if you are an investor in the deal. So you could actually kind of follow along and then, you know, who knows, maybe the next deal, two deals later, or three deals later, um, you guys feel comfortable about the nuances of affordable housing and then, or you find a different affordable housing operator, whichever one, but uh, you know, that, that offer is on the table for anybody on this call. All right. Well, Dennis and John, thank you very much for being on this monthly meeting. Our next uh, LFI monthly meeting is on March 28th at seven o'clock. And um, the guest is eluding me. Do you remember who the guest is, Sean? Uh, sorry, I was trying to get to mute. Um, I don't. Uh, I'm going no, I, is, right I think now. it's Eric, isn't uh Well, that's right. Yes, Sus Eric, Eric Sussman is coming back on to talk about the economy yeah. and right inflation what have yeah. what have you yeah he's a very um, entertaining character so this you'll be uh you'll you'll enjoy his talk yeah and i i i put in the chat but i uh see that it didn't go to everybody i th think steve just to be clear with wonder right you want people to log on to wonder before they shut down their zoom no, no they well they can shut off they can shut off zoom and then then go ahead and log, uh, or i'm sorry you can go ahead and pr press the link and then shut off your zoom correct right right okay all right, we'll see you guys on the other side then. Dennis, John, thanks very much. All right, thanks Thank a lot. you. Good, good night.